Welcome to Authentic Living with Roxanne, a place where we have conscious conversations about things that really matter in our lives. And now, here's your host, Roxanne Derhage. everyone, it's Roxanne Derhange. It's yet again another week and I have a, another amazing uh, guest with me, Linda Crockett. Linda um, attended a, a, a panel that we had not too long ago and, and it was well received and I asked Linda to come back today to speak a little bit more on her expertise, which is psychological hazards in the workplace. So Linda, uh, thanks for coming in today. Happy to be here and thanks for having me back. Oh, well, you know what? I always love when my, my guests come back and spend some more time with you, with me, sorry. So I'm going to tell you a little bit about Linda and uh, we'll, we'll delve a little bit more into her background, but she's an international specialist for pre preventing and addressing workplace psychological hazards. Um, and she's the founder of the Canadian Institute for Workplace Bullying Resources. So Linda, that's, you know, when you think about a path like this. And I'm always intrigued um, when I hear someone working in, I would say a subset of a specialty, uh, which is uh, workplace uh, concerns or workplace uh, health. Tell me kind of your path and what kind of, how does one grow up to work in psychological hazards in the, in the workplace? I think it, in 2008, when I was sitting at my rock bottom, I was wondering the same thing, Roxanne. <laughs> <laughs> But at, at that point in my career, I was a bachelor's degree social worker, and I had 22 years of experience in my profession. So I knew what abuse was. I certainly, I, I mean, I, I even supervised and trained investigators, assessors, you name it. I knew what abuse was. If it was child abuse, sexual abuse, drug abuse, domestic violence, I knew all the signs, I knew all the, the systems that you walk people through. Um, you know what I'm talking about there, the mental health system, the justice system. I walked through it with hundreds of people, thousands, families. And yet in 2008, something was happening to me in my workplace and I just couldn't figure it out. I just, I noticed this dark cloud kind of followed me everywhere I go because pretty much every time I spoke up and said, hey, you can't have an affair in the workplace, I would get transferred out. Or if I said, hey, you can't drink while you're working, I would get punished, you know. So this kind of dark cloud, cloud followed me. But I never knew why I kept getting in trouble. I thought I was doing the right thing. But at the 22-year mark, I hit rock bottom. I ended up, I was working in a cancer center. I was a medical social worker. I was helping people through one of the most difficult things you could ever help people through, whether they recovered or they passed away. I was helping families afterwards. I loved my job. This is where I wanted to dig my heels in, my roots. I wanted to stay there until I retired. But unfortunately, it turned out to be the most toxic workplace for me. Um, I was a, a target of mobbing. And mobbing is when two or more people act out with negative tactics and behaviors towards one or more people. So bullying with a gang mentality, really. And the leader of that gang was a psychologist. So you could imagine that there would be a lot of pretty sophisticated skills there in order mm -hmm. to figure out what your buttons were. His sidekick was a supervisor and she was in a, a bachelor's degree of social work as well. And the other per two people were human resource workers. And then there was a, an office manager who I would call the silent bully because she met them behind closed doors and was on their side, but never ever did anything in front of me. So on any given day, it would be any given one of them or a few of them that would uh, do something towards me that would just leave me baffled, side blinded, confused, and completely feeling unsafe, psychologically unsafe. Because I, I didn't know when I was going to walk out my office door and be accused of something that I hadn't even thought of yet, you know, or accused of stealing. I, I wrote uh, 40 hours of overtime while I was drilled like I was put through, you know, um, some sort of camp for torture. 
on these 40 hours. And when they figured out they made the mistake, there was no apology, which is constant insults, insults, insults to my reputation, to my character. Some people call it character assassination. Anyway, ended up with total, uh, I had acid reflux. I had ulcers in my stomach. I had a permanent gastrointestinal diagnosis. And I ended up with depression, anxiety. I lost so much weight and my hair was falling out. So if we all know that, you know, high long-term stress will impact your autoimmune system. And I was your basic, you know, great example of that. I looked like I was on chemo. I, by the time it was finished, I could barely say a word. I could barely talk. So I went on sick leave to get some recovery. Didn't know what this was. What was this? You know, I didn't realize it was workplace bullying or psychological harassment. I didn't realize it. And someone gave me a research paper on it. And I read about a paragraph, gasped, and threw that paper across the room thinking, that can't happen to me, not with my training. It was. It sat there for about a week. When I picked it up off the floor and read it, I mean, I was sick to my stomach. Yes, this is it. I am being psychologically harassed. I am being bullied. And it was so shaming, Roxanne, because well, look at my training. I should have seen it. I should have known better. I should have blah, 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 blah. That stuff we say to ourselves. And, you know, I went into isolation. I went into shame. I just shrunk. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think it was it was quite a long time before I realized, wait a minute, you know, doctors make mistakes. Nurses make mistakes. Police officers make mistakes. Why can't a social worker Nobody trained us on this stuff. Nobody gave us language to identify what workplace psychological harassment was or psychological violence. Nobody gave us this language. No one is to this day is training uh, first year students in nursing or first year students in social work on this topic. It should be mandatory. So we're talking 13 years ago and we're still not training. But so how was I supposed to know what this was? This is a far more insidious subtle crazy making psychological harassment it isn't childhood bullying and we could talk about that later but anyway you asked why did I end up here well I realized when I looked for help there was nothing in Canada nothing nobody was talking about it there's no help I tried four therapists they all made me worse because they didn't understand this injury and one even cried with me because she knew she couldn't help me. The <laughs> fifth one was the one that helped me. And it wasn't until I was in that fifth one that I realized I've got to do something about this. So I went and I, I got my master's degree. This was my thesis. I then uh, went out to the United States and I took Gary Namie's course, which is the Workplace Bullying Institute in the USA. And, uh, and him and I are now good friends. I have the Institute in Canada. So I still felt a real responsibility to be even more qualified than that. I then became a trauma therapist. I got certified in somatic experience and trauma therapy and EMDR and post-traumatics, a few other things. But I, I felt I really needed to be responsible uh, for these vulnerable people because I knew the walk. I knew the hell. I knew the horror of it. And I wanted to make sure I was responsible, very qualified. But I also had to heal a lot, too. So I was healing during that time. And then I started this company and just crack and open the door. It was floodgates. 13 years, I've never not been busy, not even touching the tip of the iceberg on this problem. But, you know, I'm in Canada. I'm proud to say that we have some legislation in our every province. I'm proud to say we have some federal legislation. I didn't think we'd see that in our lifetime, my lifetime, um, but we do. We still have a lot of work to do on it, but that's how I ended up here. I went through it. Wow, what, what a path. I know I was going to ask you about, uh, you know, how you began, but uh, what an unfortunate path um, through uh, such adversity, but to be able to come out, you know, the other side of it and giving what I believe is so necessary uh, because of the kind of work that I've done in um, in workplace uh, health and safety as well. So that's such an important thing. I think I realized the 2000, when I hit rock bottom, that I'd actually been trained for it all my life. So that's <laughs> why I went through it as a child. So that's why I went through it with sibling bullying. I experienced sibling bullying and childhood bullying. 
totally different than the workplace bullying. But then I started experiencing it through that 22 years in my social work career. Like I said to you, I called out an affair in the workplace and got transferred out. I called out a woman, a supervisor who was drinking and I got punished. I called out another supervisor for yelling and screaming at a secretary. I stepped up and spoke up and said the right thing, but I always got punished for it. So then I realized, yeah, I've actually been formally trained an entire life. This is going to help me in the business that I'm going to create. You know what I find fascinating, actually, in, and I'm so, goodness, thanks so much for sharing that. And I know, you know, oftentimes that vulnerability uh, for a lot of people, they keep it in. Uh, I can say, you know, uh, and I've been in the field now, I started off in trauma, by the way, at age 21, I worked with the Metro Toronto Police. And trauma, like yours, I have specialties in EMDR. I worked in complex PTSD for almost 20 years. Um, so understand what you're talking about. What I find unfortunate, and I think I can say it after all these years, I'm now 57 years old, after being in the field for so long, combination of frontline, um, managerial leadership positions, and also in health and wellness um, with one of the biggest behavioral uh, change companies uh, internationally, is that sometimes the environments that you expect that should have knowledge um, and know-how are, are oftentimes the ones that are most toxic Mm -hmm. So I wondered if we could chat a little bit about that because I can share a little bit about my experiences that sometimes they were more brutal um, than environments that you would expect less um, kind of safety in. Mm -hmm. Well, nothing, nothing shocks me anymore. I mean, 13 years I've worked with a lot of organizations and I've had thousands of targets and bystanders and I even work with the respondents. And, you know, some of the organizations that promote psychological safety, well, their staff is coming to me. That says something, doesn't it? <laughs> <laughs> I can't name names, but some people that, you know, hold um, events for psychological safety, I get their staff who are being bullied. So there's a lot of hypocrisy. There's a lot of lip service. You know, we, the larger the organization, the worse I find it. So our larger organizations, I think we can all figure out what those are. I see, for some reason, I see a lot more um, toxicity in the leadership. I don't know if it's competition. I don't know if we're not hiring for merit. We're hiring our buddies instead. Um, we're not putting in people in positions that they're, you know, trained and experienced and mentored on. We're not monitoring our leaders. They're getting away with stuff. And you've just got too many chefs in the in the kitchen. I don't know what it is, but it is far more toxic the larger the organization. Interesting, yeah, because, uh, you know, again, in my role, I manage companies, different, you know, uh, sometimes upwards of 50 companies at any given point. And sometimes it's the environments that you truly believe, you know, these are people that we talk about communication, we talk about transparency, we, tr we talk about um, you know, vulnerability, you know, to be able to join with others. And these are all things that um, you expect would be a basic kind of level of acumen. And that oftentimes would be the environments would be dealing more with people coming forward and having issues with um, arbitrations, um, you know, uh, lots of in union environments. Um, a lot of people saying, you know, I would go for it, but, you know, I know nothing's going to get done, those types of things. And I'm now I'm talking when I started in that world, it was 2000. And like you're saying, as much as 13 years ago, um, you were when you went through your concern, there really hadn't been much shift. So it's 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 um, it's great to know now uh, that there are resources because, you know, I would say. I believe that truly all of us go to work because um, we want to make a difference with, with whatever we're doing, but to go to work with the concept of um, that, I have to be a, a concerned or if I'm belittled or, you know, if there's um, harassment, but it's, it's joking. And mm -hmm. then I, like you say, I talk myself out of it, that kind of implicit belief that maybe that's not a thing. <laughs> and People stay, a little bit longer before they kind of start to talk to others to say, this isn't feeling very good for me. Um, I'm, I'm glad that, that we now have a resource like that in Canada. Yeah, we do, you know, but it's still happening. It's still, in my opinion, an epidemic. 
Um, I still see people, obviously I'm still very, very busy. So it's still a problem. And, you know, we've got people who think they can fix it. You know, they don't understand the true definition. There's a lot of confusion around the definition of what is workplace psychological harassment or psychological violence. There's a confusion there. You've got a lot of employers who are burying their head in the sand and not taking the training that is mandatory. You know, so there's mandatory that your your legislation, your policies and procedures must align with the new act, whether it's federal or provincial, it must align, right? And then you must train your staff on that policy and procedure. But that's not enough because this issue is not just a policy and procedure issue. This is a human issue. It's just like domestic violence and sexual assault. So mm -hmm. why aren't we training people on in-depth trauma-informed training? Policies and procedures, great, useless if the leaders aren't following them. And an awful lot of leaders are not following them. So they're useless. They're, they're not creating psychological safety if they're not following their policies and procedures consistently. If you don't have a co cohesive leadership team that all buys into zero tolerance, we're going to practice what we preach. We're going to walk or talk. We're going to we're going to show our staff that we are going to follow our policies and procedures, no matter what the case, we're going to follow them. That's what's going to teach your staff that you you respect psychological safety, that you protect them. That's what's going to show them that. But we don't have that happening. It's very rare. We have some great employers out there. I'm not kidding you there. We have give some we're giving out some awards this year for that. But that's not the norm, you know, right. to be following that the policies and procedures and giving them and talking about the human aspect. So it. let's 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 back up a little bit because I think I'm remiss in I know I know what it is, the definition. You are the expert in the definition. Can you tell anybody listening that's probably thinking, okay, I think I missed a step here because I'm not really sure what the actual basic definition of psychological health and safety and the requirements for the workplace. What is the basic definition of being psychologically safe under the act in the workplace? Well, again, are we talking, which province are we talking? Well, let's about? say... Let's yes. say, okay, I'm in Ontario, and then you're in Alberta. So let's talk about those two. And let's talk about the federal umbrella after that, so that people, and then, um, you know, if necessary, we can drop the link so that people can check their province to figure out what, what guidelines they have to follow. Yeah. Well, it's hard for all that. They all have different wordings. Let's say that they all have different wordings, whether it's, you know, demeaning behavior, showing is showing respect, whether it's do not humiliate, do not embarrass, do not what it reasonably know would cause harm. That that's your policy. That's what the legislation says. Wording like that. Then you have your you have international research out there that can give you definitions as well. But I actually break it down to a really simple definition and you'll see that it fits for any province. So it's 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 never a one time, that's, that's one place where our legislation fails because harassment and psychological harassment are very different. We can, we can be charged with a harassment based on one specific insult, right? If I, on those protected grounds, but psychological harassment, bullying, usually weaves in between those protected grounds. It's far more subtle and insidious. So it's never a one-time incident. So a variety of negative behaviors, tactics, nonverbals, verbals, whether it's emails, uh, text messages, photographs, whatever, a variety of these negative behaviors directed towards a specific person or a group of people. Very different from conflict. So it's directed towards a person or a group of people, like I mentioned before, mobbing, with or without conscious intent. We got to take that part out. You cannot prove intent with or without conscious intent that causes some form of harm. Mm -hmm. That's as simple as it gets. So look at the, the quote, death by a thousand cuts. I changed that to psychological injury by a thousand psychological insults. Mm. So it might not, might not be the the first 300 times that you slammed the door in my face or rolled your eyes at me or I caught you gossiping or I caught you lying to me or you accused me of something I didn't do. It might not be the 600 thing that gets me. So that's why we call people too sensitive, you know, but you're not realizing this is a cumulative injury. This is a cumulative over time, just like domestic violence, except it's psychological. 
It might be the 800th one that takes you down, Roxanne. Might be the 900th one that takes me down. Eventually, this kind of behavior is going to take anyone down. The people coming through my door are highly educated, resilient, uh, articulate, strong, dedicated, loyal people. So it isn't about a lack of. It is about an injury. We've, they've been injured. Their resilience is injured. Their self-esteem is injured. Their self-confidence, their sense of safety in the world, their identity. It's all injured. Cut by cut by cut by cut. Mm -hmm. Wow. Okay. That that really makes it very clear. So let me let me play devil's advocate for a second okay. and say it's a merger and acquisition scenario and the manager potentially is under a lot of pressure. How does one delineate between the guidelines or guideposts that that leader has to hit um, and the pressure that the frontline employee might feel and how, you know, cause I'm thinking, I, I think it becomes blurry at some point and it, because you're living in this world, if someone's listening and they're an employee saying, Oh my God, I'm, I'm going through that, Linda. <laughs> I can't, you know, how does one start to wonder, is this, hmm, this is performance based on metrics because one company is bought out another and there's some business objectives that they have to hit versus this is psychological harassment. Right. Great question. And you're right. It is blurry. And I think people have to understand that, you know, I said over a period of time, international research for consistently says over six months or more. I say three months or more. So we have to have a measurement. It's not exact, but we have to have a measurement. If someone is behaving this way towards you for a period of three months or more, I think we're safe to say we're looking at potentially a case of psychological harassment. But prior to that is abrasiveness, incivility, rudeness, meanness, you know, um, ostracism, these things happening, that that sarcasm, that the joking under the guise of, you know, whatever, that, that just inconsistency even some of that gaslighting stuff prior to that three months if you're if you're consistently being poked at then it is abrasiveness or something like that so is it a one-time incident is it because the person is grieving is it because the person has had a car accident and suffering and body pain are they under a great deal of stress certainly there are factors that can explain the behaviors but abuse is never going to be okay you know, abrasiveness, incivility is never going to be okay. If that leader's under a great deal of pressure, that leader now knows that there's a risk factor for acting out towards an employee that might get me a, a complaint of harshness, abrasiveness, or whatever. So we have to have some level of self-insight, our mm -hmm. finger on our own pulse of when have we reached our limit that where we might become that person who bites somebody else. And we might need to reach out and get ourselves an executive coach or a therapist for that matter. So if we're struggling, we need to be self-accountable, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And if you're that employee who's being bit several times because the, the uh, leader is stressed out, understanding that there's reasons going on, you have a right to say, I don't deserve that. You need to stop and find another way to manage your stress. And ultimately, if it's, you know, if it's the lack of awareness and it comes to the leader's uh, attention, um, then ultimately it's up to the leader to recognize, whoa, you know, I, I just went through the separation or, you know, I'm having some struggles with a loss or whatever. And we're all human, right? You know, gone in the days where we believe we leave, you know, um, professional in that at, you know, at the office, you hit the, the front door of your home. Now we're in such different worlds. Whereas when I was in corporate, that was the that was the given line, by the way. Uh, you forget the professional Roxanne at home, you bring the professional Roxanne to work. She works 12 hours and then she picks up the, you know, the personal Roxanne to go home. Again, I'm not sure how they thought that was possible, but that was the world that I was living in when I was in corporate. So I think absolutely, and you know, with my work, with uh, my new book, I talk a lot about responsibility of leaders um, and what I call the ROR, which is return on relationship, which is to be, which ultimately awareness is the biggest umbrella in leadership. You are 
leaders have accumulated capacity, so they are brought up and, and brought into these roles. And that with that comes a, a, a huge responsibility um, for the fact that you are, you know, leading people that have full lives and they're looking for, to you for guidance. And if you're if you're inept or impaired, you know, I don't know if inept would be the word, impaired, it's your responsibility to get the help to yeah. be able to be optimally functioning. Well, there are leaders out there that are inept. There are leaders out there that are impaired. There yeah. are leaders in positions that they shouldn't be in. And a lot of leaders know that, you know, so there's a little bit of imposter syndrome going on. Wonder, wonder when I'm going to get caught, you know, so we need to do our due diligence for leaders and set them up for success. We need to put them in positions where they're qualified for. And if they're not qualified and we believe in them, then let's train them. Let's mentor them. Let's monitor them. And let's, and, you know, confident, competent leaders don't harass their staff, their staff, confident, competent leaders don't bully their staff. You know, so that says it all right there. Uh, research shows it's quite a high percentage that is bullying top down. So that tells us we have a problem in the leadership area. Let's solve that problem. Let's make sure we're not hiring our friend because we owe a favor or our sister because we owe them a favor. Let's watch that nepotism stuff. Let's let's follow those policies. Absolutely. So important. This was such a great interview that we decided to turn it into a two-part series. Be sure to tune in next week for part two so you don't miss out on the amazing content. Thanks for tuning in to Authentic Living with Roxanne, creating the space for positive, healthy change. Roxanne is a keynote speaker, psychotherapist, and coach. To work with Roxanne, visit roxanderhajcom slash blueprint. We'll see you next time on Authentic Living with Roxanne.